Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers, and I'll serve as your host today. You can also see on the screen our presenter for the day, uh, Hugh Alley. Uh, today's webinar is part of a series leading up to the March 2021 TWI Summit and Kata Summit, of which Hugh will actually be uh, presenter and keynote speaker at. Um, I'll tell you more about those later, but you can learn more about these events as well as other events by visiting leanfrontiers.com slash summits. Just two points of logistics before we get started. Uh, today's presentation is being recorded. If you look for an email shortly after our session today, you'll find a link to the on-demand recording of this session. And please do share this with others in your organization. Secondly, due to the short nature of our webinar, we will not be fielding questions. Uh, if you do have questions, however, uh, our presenter will make his email address available uh, toward the end. So with that said, let me introduce our presenter for today, Hugh Alley. Uh, Hugh has helped organizations improve their performance over a 30-year period, mostly in manufacturing. Um, he's trained almost a 1,000 frontline leaders in core skills uh, throughout the course of his career, mostly using the uh, TWI-J programs. Uh, he has run three different manufacturing plants as well as warehouses and has achieved significant and measurable performance improvements in each of those. And Really most noteworthy, Hugh, uh, you are now a new author of a book titled Becoming the Supervisor, which you can see up on the screen here and I know we'll touch on throughout the course of our session today. So Hugh, for now, I'll go ahead and uh, turn things over to you and then when you're done, we'll come back and have a brief conversation. Thanks so much, Duane. It's really a delight to be here with you and to be chatting with you and our listeners uh, uh, on the webinar. Uh, today, I want to talk about uh, the, a cure for the bad boss uh, and give you some ideas for uh, those who live with those sorts of folks. Um, so the the starting point is that we've got bad bosses all around. And, and this comes out of a couple of things. One is they tend to be selected for technical ability rather than for their ability in leading. And then we tend to let them just loose with no training. It's kind of a sink or swim situation. Uh, and all of this is confounded because Often the people that want to be boss uh, are those who want power rather than to make the world around them better. So you sometimes have this situation where you're attracting maybe not the right people. I think there are six broad kinds of people that you see uh, as leaders, uh, the, the, the bad boss types. They're the bullies, the wimps, the know-it-alls, the control freaks, the absentees, and the unskilled. And each of them has their own special way of making our lives difficult. Here's some gross generalizations about how the six types hurt us. The bullies uh, wind up with workplaces full of blame, and they tend to eliminate any sense of initiative on the part of the people in the place. The wimps tolerate bad behavior, and with that comes all the frustration uh, when somebody's not doing their share of the work. The know-it-alls don't listen, and they wind up shutting out all the possible ideas that come from the folks who work there and control freaks undermine the confidence of the people that they oversee because they either redo stuff or they peer over your shoulder as you're doing it uh, with the not so implicit view that 
you don't know how to do it right, and I'm the only one. The absentees, well, what you see there is people losing time because they don't know what to do next. And the, the workplaces wind up full of expediting. And then you have the unskilled. And those people show up in a bunch of different ways, but what you see often is no priorities. And you see not only the leaders floundering, but their people floundering because they don't know what's up or where to go. So why are people not performing? Here's my take on the world. This is not a scientific thing, but people don't perform because either they don't know what's wanted or two, they don't know how to do what's wanted. Three, they can't do what you're asking. And four, they don't want to. The amusing thing is, you know, if don't know what to do is 60 or 70% of the world, it's surprising how often we start by assuming that number four is the reason. And you hear it when you hear somebody say, oh, that's insert name here. She doesn't care or he doesn't care or he's just filling in time. Well, maybe. But the reality is that if you've got somebody who doesn't know what to do and they're like they're long, they're like that long enough, they kind of give up. Same with if they don't know how to do their job. And my observation is that that's the case for an awful lot of bad bosses, that there are some who can't or don't want to do it. But most of them, the problem is that they don't actually know what their job is as a leader or they don't know how to do it. Now, I'm going to deal with the part three really quickly, the third type really quickly. If you've got bullies, wimps, know-it-alls, or control freaks, those are people that it's really hard to fix that one. Those are people who can't do what you want. Um, it's possible. Some are trainable, but mostly they're coming in with motivations that don't actually suit or help the organization very much. And for you, if those are people reporting to you, you really need to find them something else to do or move them out. And it's unfortunate, but you know, go back to the previous slide. It's not a large number of your, of, of your leaders. So what do we do then for the folks that are unskilled, the folks that are trainable, the folks that are the big quantity of the, the bad bosses. Well, the cure is there are five skills they need. They need to instruct, they need to improve the work, the way the work gets done. They need to address inadequate performance. They need to be able to set priorities for their workplace and they need to listen. Um, and if any of you are familiar with the training within industry model, uh, what you'll notice is that three of these are addressed directly by the TWI programs. So job instruction helps leaders know how to instruct. Job methods helps with improving the way the work gets done. And job relations helps deal with addressing inadequate performance. So what about the other two? Well, the interesting thing is that when you read the original documents from the TWI Commission and the instruction manuals, they explicitly say that what they're presenting in those manuals is the minimum, and they assume that the workplace will be teaching leaders those key skills around listening and communication. And when you look back at the context that they were dealing with when the commission was functioning, they were building these programs for the large 
manufacturing firms that tended to operate with some kind of a central planning mechanism. And so the, the frontline leaders actually didn't have a lot of questions about what next. The work was doled out on a daily basis and the sequences were clear. Uh, they didn't have to deal with that a lot. But if you look at today's world, where we have so many small and medium-sized companies, we're expecting a lot more from our frontline leaders. And a big part of that is juggling the priority questions. Um, and so that's it, it didn't get addressed in the days of the creation of the TWI programs. But still, in my view, it's one of the core skills uh, that anybody needs uh, if they're going to be leading uh, in a workplace. And all five of these skills are referenced in the book that I've written, uh, Becoming the, C the Supervisor. The thing that's really fun, I think, and, and actually it's really encouraging, is that if you can get a frontline leader who's halfway competent at, or capable at those five skills, you're actually going to have a really good supervisor. They don't need to be stars. They don't need to be masters. They need to have a good functional capability. Um, and so for uh, if you're in a position of developing people, you don't need to get them to all be uh, the stars that are going to be the next president of the company. Um, they just need to be able to get the get the, those skills executed reasonably competently. And I think that's a really encouraging thing. So when you think about it, or when, when I look at what becoming the supervisor, the book was trying to deal with, I was looking at it from two perspectives. One is for frontline leaders. And, and those people have many different job titles. You know, could be leads, it could be coordinator, it could be shift boss, charge hand. Uh, some places it's manager. Regardless, they're overseeing the work done by others and they're responsible that the work gets done right and on time. And if you're one of those folks, what you need are skills to get the people in your area to do what you want done the way you want it done because they want to do it. If you're managing those frontline leaders, you're needing to develop those people help them master skills that they need for a complex job. But that can be really tough if you don't have a great example. And so you need a practical example of how to do that, how to do the development and take advantage of the business problems that come across your, your plate. And the story in Becoming the Supervisor shows what that can look like for both of you, for both groups of people. I've done a couple of things in the book that um, I think can help people learn these skills. Uh, there are reflection questions for most chapters, some for people who are in a frontline leader role and others who are supervising them. Uh, there's a resource list. Uh, there are a bunch of templates that you can download uh, and other resources, uh, and there are links to a whole bunch of things and links to buy the book all at uh, becomingthesupervisor.com. Uh, so if you've got questions about what I've been talking about, uh, feel free to get in touch with me. Hugh at Becoming the Supervisor reaches me, or there's my phone number. Um, I think the the exciting thing for me in this is that if you look at the broad sweep of the, the bad bosses who are bad because they're actually unskilled, and that's more of them than the people who are uh, evil or malevolent, you know, the bullies and the, the wimps and the, and the, the control freaks. Um, those are a small part of the world, dangerous, but a small part of the world. But for the big part of the supervisors who are bad bosses, the thing that I think is really exciting is it's all fixable. Um, 
And so with that, Dwayne, uh, that's kind of the formal stuff I wanted to present to you. Um, and maybe you've got some questions you want to um, ask yeah, I, that come to your mind. I, I sure do, Hugh. Uh, so I, I'm sitting down here comfortable. I don't know. It uh, looks like you're standing, Hugh. I don't know I if you want to take a seat and make yourself more comfortable. Or let's just have a fireside chat. Certainly up to you. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to sit down. So let me adjust the computer and uh, I'll uh, excuse the uh, vibration on the uh, <laughs> on, on the, the camera. So you're in uh, you're in Vancouver. That's right. Yeah, yep. you're in Vancouver. And yeah, not we're, too we're, far, not too far from our friend uh, Tracy Defoe. Uh, no, Tra uh, Tracy is very close to me. She uh, uh, lives about uh, oh, seven or eight miles from me. Oh, great. Got quite a uh, brain brain trust in that area, then. <laughs> well, we do because we got Mark Rosenthal down in Everett, and oh, that's right. Um, Richard Abercrombie is just across the border in Linden, and uh, um, yeah. Well, so the that? and Hal Froelich, uh is yeah. uh, nearby Boy, too. That's great. <laughs> I didn't, it, didn't a lot make of all these connections. Yeah. Well. So, so Hugh, first of all, I, I wanted to uh, mention something and then turn that into a question. I, over the last 12 months, I've been contacted by a number of people who are working on um, training and skill development and so forth for supervisors specifically. I have a friend of mine out of England who's creating a supervisory academy. Um, and, and, you know, here comes your book. And it just leads me to, to ask the question, why is that? There there seems to be, I, I, maybe movement is too strong of a word, but there certainly seems to be an emphasis uh, out in the market on supervisors. What what's, what's your take on that? Well, what I'm hoping, Dwayne, is that uh, leaders in industry are realizing that that frontline leader is is really what makes things happen yeah and you can have all the the wonderful strategies in the world but if you can't execute um then they're not worth very much uh and so but i think what people are seeing is that as you look at the execution uh you you're only at if you're the organization your only avenue to touch the workers is through those frontline supervisors um i think the other thing that you're you're seeing more and more is people acknowledging that at least in north america we've been far too willing to accept bad behavior on the part of our leaders uh, in business, you know, that bullying behavior has been ac accepted uh, or, or forgiven. Um, and it's a very short-sighted view because you may get a little bit of a short-term bump uh, from the fear effect, uh, but long-term you don't have, you, you, you haven't built capacity and you don't have anything sustainable and, yeah. and i see more and more comments on linkedin and uh in the uh the, the writings from some of the different uh business schools saying you know we really need to take another look at how we pick our leaders hmm. well I'm, I'm hoping perhaps that uh it's an encouraging sign that we're moving away from the top-down approach to uh, you know, empowering those that are doing the work uh, even more. It, yes, I'm hoping it will too. Uh, it's not that there isn't room for the top down because the top down element is setting, well, in kata terms, the challenge. You know, yeah. you, you still need that role uh, and, and it is an important and strategic role. 
uh, and there's important work to do there, uh, but they can't do it on their own. Yeah, great. So you referenced uh, not only in your presentation, but in the book, uh, the uh, TWI programs. Uh, I'm curious, obviously you, you got some exposure to that. Have, have you actually used those skills that you write about? Oh, abs um, every one of them. Yeah. Uh, I, I said to somebody, I've got scars. <laughs> <laughs> so I've made mistakes, but I've also used them. And, uh, you know, w one of the plants I ran, uh, uh, and, you know, talking about Tracy, she was really helpful in getting me started on this. And that was 13 years ago. Yeah. Uh, we, I, I walked in to a place where my predecessor, uh, we'll talk about the bad, bad boss types. Uh, he was an absentee boss. Uh, well, um, he was a mix of absentee and control freak, um, and which is weird, but that's what he was. But I walked into a really poisonous environment where the, the team leads and the supervisors just didn't have the skills they needed to uh, to deal with the employees. And so we started with JR uh, and just going through the JR process with the uh, with the leads and the supervisors, it 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 sh it shifted the organization. And we got a 10% productivity gain. Like we could measure it. We measured the productivity as shipped dollars per company employee. And, and, and that value went up 10% in a year. Hmm. In, in, in just from the job instruction stuff, or sorry, the job relations stuff. Because yeah. now people were being treated with respect. Uh, we weren't tolerating bad stuff, bad behavior. We were addressing issues, uh, and people were collaborating more. Hmm. I, I don't know uh, if you can maybe expound on this a little bit, but one of the things that I've personally learned is um, somebody can tell me how I need to change my mindset, but that doesn't necessarily translate into changing my behavior. Yep. What 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 I've learned though, uh, specifically with uh, you know job job relations, for instance, by practicing some of the behaviors, it in turn changed my mindset. Yes, yes. I I, I think there there's an interesting uh, observation. It's not original to me. That that basically says it's easier to act your way your, into new thinking than to think your way into new acting. Yeah. And and so having, you know, in, in, the, in the J programs, you actually put people through the practice of doing things. Uh, and because of the structure of the programs, not only did they do it, but they see eight or 10 other people do it they realize that actually this stuff does work and and so it's remarkably effective at overcoming a lot of the resistance that people might have to a conventionally introduced oh here we're going to teach we're going to teach you for an hour how to be respectful well yeah. that the stuff doesn't work i don't think yeah and, and that's one of the beauties of the TWI programs, right? Uh, t touch on the skills that are taught in, uh, so we just touched on job relations. What about job instruction and job methods? What, what are some of those skills that are leading to the, the mindset and behavior changes? So in job instruction, uh, one of the, 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 the biggest thing that you get, that people learn, I think, uh, well, actually, there are two big things. One is that they learn to separate 
steps from key points from reasons and just separating out those three kinds of information is really helpful to the learner but it's also really helpful to the instructor because now as the person is doing the task they know what to look for it's very clear what what they might be doing wrong that you need to guide them on so that's the one piece and the second piece that they learn is that repetition matters um, the the job instruction model uh, involves eight repetitions of the the new skill four that you watch with increasing amounts of information each time and four that you do telling back that information uh, and it turns out there's a really good sound research reason for it uh, it turns out that somewhere in the eight to ten repetitions is enough for somebody to get about 75 percent of standard performance of a task hmm. well, if you can put somebody onto the floor and they're already at 75 percent of standard that's wonderful So uh, real quickly, um, Hugh, I had Skylar come in here uh, in, in the back of the room because I lost my connection from my computer to oh to the the production computer. So when when we're all done, you'll need to shut down. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so uh, yeah, th that reminds me, Hugh. Of, I, I had a mentor at one point um, who was instructing me on. Uh, uh, some behaviors, and I kept questioning, well, why do I need to do that? And his response back, uh, it's going to sound harsher than the way he meant it, but his response back was, I didn't ask you to understand it, I asked you to do it. His <laughs> point being that eventually I would understand it because I've done the practice that he's he's instructed. Yeah. So, I mean, I can I can see how that might come across as harsh, but um, if I if I can use a sport analogy, um, when somebody's learning to play soccer, they're taught how to kick a ball straight and where to hit with their foot. Yeah. Now Ronaldo can kick from any part of his foot as he's doing a backwards flip but we don't ask people to start there right and you need to you need to build the 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 muscle memory if you will of a good straight kick first and then you can get to bend it like beckham but <laughs> you don't start by trying to learn a bent the the the, the curve kick yeah and and so what your your mentor was doing is saying, learn the 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 best known way now. And once you've mastered that, then you'll be in a position to uh, to appreciate what it offers you and what its drawback, its limitations are. Yeah. Uh, and and job instruction's really good at helping people through that. Yeah, that's great. Um, we're, we're getting close to, uh, to to our end time here. Yeah. Um, I really wish we had more time to talk. And so maybe maybe this opens up an opportunity for us to, to come back and maybe do this again, uh, because I do have a lot of other questions and, and I, I'm particularly personally intrigued with this this line of uh, line of thinking it's, as, as it's impacted me a great deal. So, Hugh, I really appreciate your efforts in putting this book together because I think it really puts together in a in a, a readable, understandable way uh, some very important uh, concepts that we need in business today. So, thank you for taking the time to put that together. Well, I. I... I'm I'm hoping that it uh, will be helpful to a few people, lots of people. And my understanding is the book is now for sale and it's actually done pretty well, right? 
Yeah, it it reached uh, number one uh, on Amazon in three different categories uh, shortly great. after it launched. So I was pretty Fantastic. excited about that. Well, congratulations! I know a lot of a lot of time and effort and blood, sweat, and tears goes into putting a book together. So uh, I'm glad you're reaping some of the rewards and the accolades that that you certainly deserve for that. So. Hugh, thank you so much again for the book. Thanks for your thought leadership. Thanks for your insights today. Um, and I know it's still a ways off, but hopefully we'll be able to see each other uh, face to face at the TWI Summit and the CADA Summit, which is coming up in the spring of 2021 on beautiful Jekyll Island, Georgia. One Georgia. of the favorite nice. places that Lean Frontiers has uh, ever held an event. So no. we certainly welcome you to that. Yeah, March uh, the 9th. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, great. You can find out more information about those events as well as other events that Lean Frontiers offers by visiting leanfrontiers.com slash summits. And as mentioned earlier, you'll receive an email from me uh, shortly uh, after we're done here with a link to the recording. As I, as I suggested earlier, please share that with others in your organization. Great opportunity to, to do a lunch and learn or something along those lines uh, and all learn together. So thanks again, Hugh. Thanks to everyone who participated in today's webinar. Have a good day. Now go do good things. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.